Six selected or high compressed sense and high dimensional regression, uh, you realize that this is very similar to Danzig selector. Uh, it can be implemented by linear programming, so it's very easy to compute. And you do this, and you get estimates for each column separately. But of course, there's no guarantee that the resulting matrix is symmetric. But that's relatively easy to deal with. So once you have the preliminary, preliminary estimate called omega 1, you simply symmetrize by keeping the one with smaller absolute value. So you have a symmetric matrix, and with high probability you can also show that this matrix is semi-positive definite. And if you really like, you can also put that constraint in in the original optimization. But it turns out the effect is minimum. Now, how good is the estimate? So we are going to look at the property of this estimate over a class of sparse precision matrix. And if you're not familiar with this type of L LQ ball, you can take Q to be zero so that every row and every column of the matrix has at most K non-zero elements. Otherwise, if you use this Q, it can relax that exact sparsity to approximate sparsity. And this type of covariance matrices has been well studied in different contexts. And we also need some, we don't really need Gaussian annuity, but what we need is some tail property of the distribution. Either the distribution has exponential type tails or it has certain polynomial type tails. So we need to have some tail bound for the distribution. And given all these conditions, then one can show that the resulting estimate of that estimate, the estimate is called climb or constrained L1 minimization estimate satisfy this bound. So with high probability, the difference between the estimate and the truth under the spectral norm is bounded above by this m to the power 2 minus 2q times k is a sparsity parameter and log p over n to this power. And everything else is fairly clear except this m. And this m is the L1 norm bound for the precision matrix. L1 norm is a matrix L1 norm. So it's the maximum of the absolute sum of the columns. So each column you sum them up in terms of absolute value, you take the maximum, and that's the L1 norm. And this L1 norm appears in the upper bound here. And for graphical model, of course, you don't really care about the specific values. You may want to say, estimate the support of the matrix. Uh, if that's your goal, you need one additional step. So you do thresholding. So after you get the matrix, you threshold. You only keep the larger one and kill the small one. And under certain conditions, one can show that the thresholding estimate is sign consistent. In other words, you estimate zero by zero, you estimate the positive elements by positive elements, and so on. And as I said, it's easy to implement, and we have a package on my website. And also we have done all sorts of numerical analysis of the estimate, and it works quite well. But theoretically, a more intriguing question for us is whether that's the best one can do, whether that's the optimal estimate. So the question is, is this rate optimal? And it bothered us for a long time. And we couldn't show one way or another. And until recently, we resolved the issue. It turns out the answer is not quite. It's almost optimal, but not exactly optimal. What intrigued us, first of all, is this M term. Whether this term should be there or it shouldn't be there. Because for all the covariance matrix estimation, instead of estimating its inverse, there's no such thing as M. It always depends on the sparsity and then the sample size dimension and so on. There's no M. So the question is whether this M should be there. But it turns out the optimal rate, everything else is optimal. So K should be there, and log, N, log P over N to this power is exactly right. And in addition, M should be there. There must be M there in the lower bound. 
but the power is not right. The power should be 1 minus Q instead of 2 minus 2Q. Uh, if we think about this problem, the root cause of the problem is that precision matrix estimation is intrinsically a heteroscedastic problem. So the elements are not of the same variance. The noise levels are different for different elements. And, but we use a single lambda. By using a single lambda, intrinsically, we treat the problem as if we have a homoscedastic problem. The noise levels are all the same across all the elements. And in this case, they're not true not even at the order of magnitude. So we need to do something more careful. So let's think about this matrix called S, S star. S star is simply what's in the constraint. Originally, we take the upper bound to be lambda. But now let's look at the elements in this matrix more carefully by computing its variance. It turns out the variance has two different kinds of expressions, one for the diagonal elements and the one for the off-diagonal elements. But the key here is that it depends on the diagonal elements of the sample not sample, the diagonal elements of the population covariance matrix and also the diagonal elements of the precision matrix. But those, of course, are unknown. But sigma ii is relatively easy to estimate because we have the sample covariance matrix to begin with. And this omega jj is tough because we want to estimate omega and we don't know anything about omega. And we can also do a relatively fine analysis of the High, prob high probability bound. Basically, the ij element of this matrix is upper bounded by this quantity with very high probability. So it would be nice if we have a good estimate of those two quantities. And we can estimate sigma ii by the corresponding sample version, but we do need to have an estimate of the diagonal of the precision matrix. So we are going to apply a two-step procedure. The first step, we want to estimate this, the diagonal. So we want to obtain preliminary estimates of the diagonal of the precision matrix by using essentially the climb, what we used before, but with a small adjustment. So we are going to adjust the upper bound in a slightly different way. And this BJJ is essentially the no, uh, a generic notation for the omega JJ and appears on both sides, both here and here. B this bold face B sub J is a B column of the sample coins uh, of the precision matrix. So there appears on both sides, but it's still a convex problem and we can solve. And once we solve this, we have a pre preliminary estimate of the diagonal. And once we have the preliminary estimate of the diagonal, we can adjust omega ij according to what we have earlier here. But basically, we put in the estimated version here. And that's our lambda j, ij. And the final estimate is obtained by same symmetrization step. And it can be shown that this estimate First of all, th again, this estimate has nothing to do with anything that's unknown. We don't use the sparsity parameter or anything like that. So it's an adaptive procedure. And one can show that this estimate attains this rate. So it's m to the power 1 minus q times k times log p over n 1 minus q over 2. Everything else remains the same except the power now is 1 minus q. And of course, the question is whether this can be further improved. And the answer is no. It turns out that one can derive a matching lower bound for this matrix estimation problem. And based on this lower bound, it says that at least as far as rate is, con rate is concerned, there's nothing more can be improved. So that's the optimal rate of convergence. And What's interesting is that this depends on this M. And it's not, still not quite clear to us intuitively why it should be there, except it's there, because it's in the lower bound, so it must be there.
And I don't want to get into detail the discussion about how we obtain the lower bound, but I only want to give you a very high level description of the lower bound techniques. Because the lower bound, turns out the lower bound methods for matrix problem, it's quite different from the conventional lower bound argument for signal pr recovery problems. And those methods doesn't work in this case. So it takes three steps to derive this rate sharp minimax lower bound. The first one is we want to do a reduction. We want to reduce this estimation over a very large class of co precision matrices to a relatively small number, a finite number of precision matrix. But of course, this reduction should be done carefully so that we don't essentially e decrease the level of difficulty. Because if the problem is smaller, maybe it's a lot easier. And then we apply the general minimax lower bound technique initially developed in the paper with Harry Zou for estimation of sparse covariance matrix, but not sparse precision matrix. And as I mentioned before, the standard lower bound techniques, all the methods we know before, doesn't work. And the key step is the last step. This, this step takes many pages of proof. It's try to bound the total variation distance between mixture distributions. You mix over many, many high dimensional Gaussian distribution with non-identity precision, uh, with non-identity precision matrix. And that part, part is technically very involved. And in terms of the mixture distribution, it looks like this. In terms of the precision matrix, oh, this should be omega, not sigma. Basically, you can forget about this is a precision matrix, a symmetric positive definite. Just focus on, say, up right part. So focus on this corner here. So the key is that you lay down a class of precision matrices such that every row has a given number of non-zero elements. And the number of non-zeros is, is basically of this, say if you take Q to be zero, it's basically K over two. And then you mix over all possible locations for those ones, for these non-zero elements. And not only that, for each row and each column, you attach a Bernoulli variable zero ones. If it's zero, it means the whole row is zero. Otherwise, it's one of those sparse vector. So you can imagine, in this finite collection of matrices, the total number is very large. And it turns out you can make an argument that the number has to be large. If the number is small, then no matter how you choose, it doesn't work. So you need to mix over a large collection of matrices in order to make it work. And it, it requires some more technical calculations to show that indeed it works. So and finally, I want to discuss some uh, very briefly some other related problems. One problem, as I mentioned earlier, is estimation of functionals. And a naive method is, of course, you get a good estimate of the whole matrix. Then whatever you want to do, you can compute based on this matrix. If you want to know the, say, the principal components, you calculate the principal components, the leading eigenvectors of this estimate. The bad news is typically it doesn't work. The estimate, the plugging estimate, typically doesn't give you an optimal estimate of what you want to do for the functional. Same with the eigenvectors. So if you want to do principal component ana analysis, it turns out that you should do principal component analysis directly. And same with classification and discriminant analysis. Uh, in some cases, you can. Once you have a good estimate of sigma inverse or omega, you can plug in. But in other applications, it turns out in some, in some setting, it's impossible to estimate omega very well. But still, you can do classification very well. And there are ways to do that. And I don't have time to discuss that today. And same with Gaussian graphs or other more general graphs. 
and the question is how you do that directly without say going through this routine or if you go through this routine how can you take into account your main object of interest is a graph not the matrix and there are also a wider range of testing problems where you want to test on the structure of the covariance matrix or the precision matrix and there are many interesting problems and one interesting problem for example is testing for sub matrices and that's a quite interesting problem where you have a big matrix you observe this matrix with say IID Gaussian and you just want to know whether the whole matrix is zero there's no signal at all or there exists a small sub say k by k sub matrix that's not zero and this testing problem turns out to be very interesting and there are other problems that you can go beyond covariance matrix. For example, instead of covariance matrix of high dimensional random vectors, you can have random vectors observed on a lattice graph or on some other well-structured object. Then what you want to estimate is not a matrix, it's an operator. And there are many interesting phenomena there and also for example for general matrix there's a whole literature on estimation of low rank matrices and we don't have time to discuss in great detail and I guess I'll stop here and the papers on my website thank you Okay, so the question is what one can do if the sparsity is in the structure of the latent variables? I think it's a great question, but we haven't thought about that. And how can we take advantage of that kind of information in estimation? So before we close, we will do the usual, by now, the usual tradition. Thank you so much for giving the talk. And Thank you. Thank you.